It was the original, you mean you have played? Oh, oh, I did it. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. <clears throat> That's a bit strange. Oh. Okay, I think I figured it out. Yeah. So it's a bit odd, but this screen the box is the only thing that's showing. Oh, yeah. So that way you can still see everything. I'm just going to like, however you want to adjust it. Just make it smaller so that I can see more notes. Yeah. <laughs> This is what I have to do. You can do it on your computer as well. Yeah, it's a nice thing to do. Okay. Yeah, um, you mind just fixing the mic real quick? Yeah, I'll just get it for you real quick. There we go. Awesome. Is it actually green? Oh. Wait. Yeah, I think you do. Yeah, she knows about all the techie stuff, so. Apologies. Oh, there we go. What does it mean when it's blue, by the way? Oh. Just click it again and it should be Should we get started? Okay, perfect. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. I appreciate it. Please have your attention real quickly. Can I please have your attention, please? Thank you, y'all. If y'all may just take a seat real quick before we get started with today's event, that would be great. Um, so my name is Rafael Barrientos Posa, and I'm the Dean's Brand Ambassador for the UCR School of Public Policy. We'd like to welcome you to today's seminar titled Before Gentrification, the Creation of DC's Racial Wealth Gap. Um, and this event is part of the UCR School of Public Policy Community Seminar Series, which brings policymakers, practitioners, and researchers to campus to speak about various public policy issues. For the first hour or so, our speaker will give a presentation. Then for the final 30 minutes, we will move on to an audience Q&A that I myself will be moderating. Without further ado, I'm honored to introduce to our to you all our guest speaker for today's seminar, Dr. Tanya Galash Boza, which is a founder of the Racism, Capitalism, and the Law Lab, a professor of sociology at the University of California, Merced, and the executive director for the University of California, Washington Center, also known as UCDC. She has spent the majority of her scholarly career working to understand why racial and economic disparities exist, how race, racism intersects with capitalism, and how our legal system upholds these iniquities. She is the author of over 50 academic articles and six books. Her latest book, after which the seminar was titled, was awarded the Robert E. Park Book Award of the Community and Urban Studies Section of ASA. Dr. Galash Bose's public outreach includes her blog, Get a Life PhD, which has over 4.5 million page views and op-eds, and other essays which have appeared in Al Jazeera, The Boston Review, The Nation, 
Newsweek, the Houston Chronicle, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. For this and her other outreach work, Professor Galash Boza was awarded the UC Merced Senate Faculty Award for Distinguished Scholarly Public Service in 2013, and the UC Merced Senate an Award for Excellence in Faculty Mentorship in 2019. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. If you need anything, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Um, we'll talk a little bit about a book I recently have come out and look forward to your questions. Um, so white people in the United States have on average eight times the wealth of black people. And wealth is important because it can be used to create opportunities, maintain financial security, and pass along a legacy to the next generation. And here in the United States, if you don't have significant wealth and you have a significant medical emergency, you risk being put in lifelong debt. And it's also nearly impossible to send your children to university if you don't have significant wealth unless you want to put them in lifelong debt. So people who study wealth inequality in the United States focus on home ownership because inequality and home equity accounts for most of the racial wealth gap. White people have more wealth than black people in large part because they're more likely to own homes and the homes that white people own are likely to be worth more. So there's a significant racial home ownership gap in the United States. Less than half of black people own the home where they live as compared to three quarters of white people. So activists have long fought to narrow the racial home ownership gap because of its relationship to the racial wealth gap. So it seems logical that we can narrow the racial wealth gap by narrowing the racial home ownership gap, but is this actually true? So I'm gonna answer this question today through a discussion of how home ownership has created wealth in white communities, whereas black communities in Washington DC have been subjected to disinvestment, carceral investment, and gentrification. So I'm, what I'm gonna share with you today is based on a large project focused on Washington DC. Have did a lot of data collection, a lot of data analysis. Won't bore you with the details, but happy to answer any questions about Q and A, about data um, during the Q and A. So first let's just take a look at why white home ownership has led to white wealth. So the assumption that home ownership will lead to wealth accumulation is based on the experiences of white homeowners. For white people, home ownership has translated into intergenerational wealth because white people's homes have consistently increased in value. White people benefited from federally subsidized home ownership programs created in the aftermath of the Great Depression. And what these home ownership programs did is they made their interest rates low, which meant that they were able to build up a lot of home equity. So white neighborhoods also feature well-funded schools and school quality is highly correlated with home values. So this combination of government funding through the loans and community assets through the schools allowed white people's homes to increase in value consistently across the 20th century. Now between 1933 and 1978, federal government subsidies enabled over 35 million families in the United States to purchase homes. And as a direct consequence of these federal policies, home ownership became the primary vehicle for wealth accumulation. So before the 1930s, it wasn't the case that most people's wealth in their home, but these particular policies created in the 1930s created a situation where most people's wealth is in their homes. And these families today will pass on trillions of dollars of wealth to their children through this accumulated home equity. But these federal policies that created home equity primarily benefited white people. Only 2% of the mortgages created through the Federal Housing Administration went to black home buyers between 1945 and 1959. Um, this is because the FHA designated any area where black people lived as high risk for mortgage. And in addition to that, the Homeowners Loan Corporation created maps where they literally colored in red any area where black people live. And this process is now known as redlining because of the maps that were created by um, the Homeowners Loan Corporation. So in Washington, D.C., um, the federal redlining meant that the Federal Housing Administration insured five times as many mortgages in the primarily white suburbs as it did in the primarily black city. And within D.C., there were FHA loans, but most of those went to the primarily white areas of the city. So these maps were created in the 1930s, and that was one moment in the history of redlining. 
But the word redlining continues to apply because now it just generally means areas where banks refuse to issue loans or issue um, loans in the secondary market that are not to have higher interest rate and, and, and less favorable terms. Um, so one study in Washington, D.C. found that only 3% of the mortgages made by the Chevy Chase Federal Savings Bank between 1976 and 1992 were in D.C. neighborhoods that were not white. And oral histories with lenders from the same study found that they were specifically told not to issue loans um, south of Calvert Street or east of Connecticut Avenue. So the, the bank officials told their lenders do not issue loans in primarily black areas, again, because they were concerned that the homes would not increase in value, but this came, this turned out to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so redlining made it more difficult for African-Americans to secure home loans and thus to build wealth through home equity. Redlining also meant that when black people did secure loans, the interest rates were higher, meaning that they would pay more for homes. Redlining also made it more difficult for black business owners to secure loans, which meant that black neighborhoods have fewer businesses. And this lack of neighborhood amenities meant that homes in black neighborhoods did not increase in value as quickly as homes in amenity-rich white neighborhoods. So in addition to subsidizing loans in white areas, the government also invested in public amenities, such as highways, water systems, and public schools in white areas. Today, I'm just gonna focus on schools as one example of public investment to give you an idea of the disparities. So by 1970, 99% of DC of black students in DC attended schools that were majority black, making it a very segregated school system. There was a small number of white students in the DC public school system, but they almost all attended schools in the primarily white area of the city. And the greatest disparities in schooling were between schools west of the park and schools east of the river. So Washington, D.C. is divided by a huge park called Rock Creek Park. So west of the park has historically been primarily white, primarily upper middle class. And then east of the park is the area where Samba has changed a lot. But really east of the river is, is, has been historically um, low income and then of late majority black. So, um, so there was a study done, really a court case that was done that happened in, the 19, in 1971. And they, they, the, the, the community was suing D.C. public schools for inequality. Um, and one of the basis was that there were 18.1 students west of the park in schools, 18.1 students per teacher west of the park, as compared to 22 students per teacher in Anacostia. Schools west of the park were spending 40% more per student than schools in Anacostia. And then the average test scores west of the park were 2.4 grades higher than in the rest of the city. So schools, um, and there were even more disparities when we looked at the schools in the suburbs versus schools in the city. So in 1985, a group of parents issued a report comparing Coolidge High, which is a majority black high school in DC, with two schools in the primarily white suburbs, Marshall High in Fairfax County and Rockville High in Montgomery County. And they found that there was tremendous disparities. So Coolidge had similar enrollments to these two suburban schools, but Coolidge had fewer teachers, less per pupil spending, fewer counselors, less investment in athletic teams and less in, and, and fewer library books. And, and the, the most significant line item on here is that Coolidge, the budget for athletic coaches was eight times as high at Rockville High than it was at Coolidge High. So people in white neighborhoods benefited from these federally subsidized loans, as well as public investments, which in turn increased their home equity and their wealth. This is because homes are not the value of a home is not just the brick and mortar of the home, the amenities inside the home. The value of the home is highly correlated with everything in the neighborhood, including the businesses that are there, the public um, services that are there, and, and the schools. Right? People will pay a lot more money to live in a good school district. Um, but what about black homeowners? One thing interesting about redlining, a lot of people will assume that redlining meant black people didn't buy homes, but that's not what happened. It meant that black people did buy homes, but on less favorable terms. Um, so only one in five black people lived in homes they owned in 1940. And by 1950, one in three did. And by 1970, over 40% of black people in the United States lived in homes they owned. And notably, during this period from 1940 to 1970, there was actually greater percentage increase every decade between, for black, than the, uh, the greater percentage increase of black homeownership than white homeownership. And the number of Black homeowners in Washington, D.C. increased sixfold 
between 1940 and 1970. By 1970, there were nearly 45,000 black homeowners in Washington, D.C., as compared to only 7,000 black homeowners in 1940. But this growth in home ownership for black people in D.C. did not diminish the racial wealth gap. Um, in, Washington, in the Washington metropolitan area today, white people have 81 times the wealth of black people. So high rates of home ownership do not translate to less uh, racial, less, a smaller racial wealth gap. So let's just take a close look at why this happened. Why is it, how did black people buy homes and why didn't these homes increase in value and why did that, why is the racial wealth gap so big? Um, so first thing to notice is that before, in, in, before 1948, many of the homes in Washington, D.C. had racial de racially restrictive covenants in the deed. A racially restrictive covenant, this is an example of, actually this is the home that my parents purchased in 1976. So this home, this deed says, like in the in the deed, when you purchase the home, it said, this home shall not be leased, rented, sold, transferred, or conveyed unto or in trust for any Negro or colored person or any person of Negro blood or extraction. So many of the homes in Washington, D.C. had these in them. So there was a group of researchers called um, Prologue D.C., and they actually are in the process of mapping all of the racial deed covenants in Washington, D.C., as well as the petition covenants, which are just like neighborhood petitions um, where a group of people get together to um, sign a petition that we're not going to sell a home to black people. And um, as a side note, um, I'm actually collaborating with them. So students who come to UCDC that want to help out with this project um, can help go through the deeds in Washington, D.C. and find um, examples of racially restrictive covenants. So. So one example of the collaborations and internships we have, but I've been long-term partners of this group, Prolog DC, who's done so much work to help us to understand the depths of racial inequality in housing in DC. Okay, now there, these these racial these racially restricted covenants are still in the deeds today, but they're not enforceable. So if you own a home in Washington DC and you look up your deed, it might have this language in it but it's not enforceable. You can legally sell a home, do whoever you want to sell a home to today. Um, so what happened is in 1948, the Supreme Court determined that these racially restrictive covenants are unenforceable. And that made it possible for African-Americans to purchase homes in these neighborhoods where they had not previously been, had not previously been possible. And that allows some black people to move into these neighborhoods. But further research that we've done shows that the biggest shift from the neighborhood going from all white to all black is when the schools were desegregated in 1954. But these two court decisions were significant for the racial transition of the neighborhood. Um, so let's look at one story just to kind of bring a little understanding to this. So Dr. Clarence Hinton is one of the African-Americans who purchased a home in an all white neighborhood. When Dr. Hinton purchased his home at 13th and Farragut Streets, Northwest Washington, DC in 1953, he was the first black person on his block. And over the next 20 years, Dr. Hinton's block became all black. So this process whereby white people left the city in large numbers is called white flight. So white flight happened across the city. Um, the white population of Washington DC decreased by one third in one generation. And white flight also opened up home ownership opportunities for black people. So by 1980, there were 50,000 black homeowners in DC. So we, we talk a lot about white flight in urban studies, but one thing that we don't talk about a lot is how white flight actually opened up black homeownership opportunities because they were not able to purchase homes prior to white flight. Um, so black flight, black homeownership did actually, did, did lead to black, so um, white flight led to black homeownership, but it did not lead to black wealth. And one of the main reasons is that homes in black neighborhoods did not increase in value in the same way that homes in white neighborhoods did. Um, so let's look at why this happened. Um, so white neighborhoods received federal subsidies and good schools, but black neighborhoods experienced disinvestment. So disinvestment is when the public and private sectors stop investing in a community. Um, so this is a picture of the Petworth neighborhood in Washington, D.C. in the 1940s. And that is a ton of private investment, right? See the real estate development and public investment, the roads, the streetlights, et cetera. Now, this is not the exact same neighborhood, but this is an extreme example of Baltimore of disinvestment. So when you stop investing in a neighborhood over many decades, it becomes extremely disinvested. Um, now, in Washington, D.C. and in cities across the country, 
segregation allows the state to decide, it creates a scenario where the state can decide to invest more heavily in certain neighborhoods than other and make those decisions along racial lines. So in Washington, D.C., the D.C. public school system was 93% black in 1970. Right, so disinvestment in the public school system was effectively disinvestment in the black community. The public housing system in Washington, D.C. in 1970 was 99% black. So disinvestment in public housing was effectively disinvestment in, public, in black communities. So let's go back to Dr. Hinton's story. So in the decades after African-American physician Dr. Hinton purchased his home on Fergus Street, he watched all of his white neighbors leave. And I want you to just think about the fact that this is a middle class doctor purchasing his first home in a very nice new neighborhood. Um, and over the next 50 years, he would watch this neighborhood completely shift. Um, whereas white people who purchase homes in the same time period would, would see their neighborhoods continuously improve. Um, so let's take a close look at what happened to one high school. This is Theodore Roosevelt High School. This is the high school in Petworth that Dr. Hinton's daughters attended. So Roosevelt High was desegregated in 1954 and it became majority black a few years after it desegregated. And Roosevelt High had been an excellent school prior to desegregation. It was a blue ribbon school. Even in the 1950s when not a lot of people went to college, it sent a large percentage of its graduates to college. Um, it was noted for its high standards of scholarship um, and it was just an excellent school all around. Uh, and then when Bonnie Benson, um, so there was a, so Bonnie Benson is the daughter of Robert Taft Benson, who was the Secretary of Agriculture. And he sent his daughter Bonnie to Roosevelt High School in 1956. And she went with her on her trip with her father to Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. And she took the school's yearbook with her to highlight um, successful integration, showing that, you know, black and white students were playing together. They were going to this excellent school. Um, but a couple of things happened. First of all, when Bonnie graduated in 1958, and by that time, the school was 80% black, nearly all the white students left. And then a couple years later, the school became all black. And Bonnie Benson probably didn't mention to the international community that the swimming pool at Roosevelt High closed when the school integrated. And that swimming pool only reopened a few years ago, about five or, ten, five or seven years ago. Right? So that's another example of disinvestment in communities as they become majority black. But it's important to know that Roosevelt High did not become a low-performing school immediately after becoming majority black. It took several decades of disinvestment. Um, so it continued to offer an excellent education to Dr. Hinton's children, for example. So Dr. Hinton sent his daughter Audrey to Roosevelt High in 1961. Um, and many of Audrey's classmates have done exceedingly well. Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson, who graduated from Roosevelt in 1964, became the first black woman to earn a doctorate at MIT. Sharon Pratt became the mayor of Washington, DC. And Charlene Drew Jarvis became the president of Southeastern University. So these highly successful black women all attended Roosevelt in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, and then Isabel Wilkerson, who you may have heard of, who wrote the book Cast, also attended Roosevelt High in the late 1960s and early 1970s. However, by 1992, Roosevelt High ranks nearly last as 16 out of 17 schools in DC for its promotion rate. One in three students who enrolled in Roosevelt in the ninth grade at, um, did not graduate high school. And in that same year, only 33 of Roosevelt's 915 students took the advanced placement exams and not a single student passed the advanced placement exam. So Roosevelt High went from being one of the best schools in the city in the 1960s to one of the worst by the 1980s. And schools are often reflections of their neighborhoods. But if you look at the census data of the, the, the average income, the average employment rate of the neighborhoods surrounding Roosevelt High, you don't see any significant changes. The only big change is that the neighborhood went from 100% white to 95% black. And you see a concomitant decline in public investment. And one of the most straightforward ways to see this kind of overall disinvestment in public schools is that in 1954, there were 100,000 students in the DC public school system. And by 1970, there were 150,000, but the budget remained relatively flat. So there was not increases in the spending in public schools in DC as the school system was growing. Also really important to note that in this time period, um, DC's city laws budget was controlled by Congress. DC didn't have autonomy at this time. So 
the decision making surrounding public spending was made entirely by Congress, which was not elected by the local population. Um, so disinvestment meant that schools like Roosevelt and Coolidge, which is cl close to Roosevelt, had fewer teachers, athletic teams, and library books. And schools also had significant structural deficiencies. Um, there was a report that came out in 1985 that pointed out these, these horrible deficiencies. And these are some pictures from the 1985 report. And then there was another report that came out in 2003 that said, you know, things really hadn't changed. So remember, there's the 1971 court case, 1985 report, 2003 report. So all of these are cases of parents, you know, many of whom middle class parents that have the time and resources to fight back and they're not seeing any returns on this time investment. So the school system remained in poor condition for decades. And this had significant impacts on some of the people that we interviewed. So um, for the, one of the sources of data for this book is interviewing people who lived in Washington, D.C. during this time period and who were subsequently incarcerated. So uh, one of the people I interviewed, his name is Troy, and he went to Coolidge High School. And Troy, when he went to Coolidge, he joined the football team. Um, but that kept him busy. But his coach was struggling with drug addiction, and his coach often didn't show up to practice. And Troy found that very demotivating. So Troy explained, you know, when I was on the football team, by the time you go to practice, you're just trying to go home and go to sleep. It wasn't time to be outside or do anything else. Um, but once the coach stopped showing up, you know, I, that fell apart. So Troy found himself with large amounts of free time after dropping off the football team, and he began to sell drugs. And that eventually led to him spending 10 years behind bars. So for Troy and many other youth in the city, um, disinvestment in public schools meant that they turned to the streets. And one thing I also found in my research is that class was not a protective factor against, um, the, uh, in terms of the war on drugs on black men in Washington, D.C. in the 1980s and 1990s. So Troy was just one of many youth in D.C. who, became, who began selling crack cocaine. Um, crack cocaine stepped in to fill the gaps left wide open as both the public and private sectors abandoned the city. By 1990, half of all black youth in DC were unemployed. By 1997, half of black male youth were under the control of the criminal legal system. So with high unemployment and failing schools, young men began to sell crack in open air drug markets to make ends meet and crack was lucrative. So then we saw the rise of turf wars. Um, so by 1991, Washington, D.C. had the highest homicide rate in the country. Um, and this homicide rate affected black neighborhoods across the city, working class neighborhoods, poor black neighborhoods, middle class black neighborhoods. And nearly all of the victims of homicide in D.C. were young black men. So the city's response to the problems created by the violence of disinvestment was not to then begin to invest in schools and communities in ways that was to support them, Instead, the response was to invest in prisons and policing in ways that would punish them. So in D.C. and across the country, the local and federal government began a war on drugs that would devastate black communities for generations. And this war on drugs marked a significant shift in budget priorities. So when D.C. DC Council Chairman David Clark presented his $2.1 billion budget request to Congress in 1984, this was before crack arrived in the city. He opened with these remarks. The programmatic priorities of this budget are the priorities of our citizens, jobs, housing, education, youth, senior citizen services, prog programs for people in need of medical and social services, and economic development. By the time of these comments, the departure of white residents and then the departure of the black middle class has shrunk the city's tax base, which left the city without the revenue that it needed to attend to the needs of its residents. But then by the end of the 1980s, the economic crisis had only deepened, but the city's focus had shifted firmly away from social services and towards the war on drugs. Crack took center stage, and this was clear in the city's budget hearings. In a 1989 congressional hearing on appropriations, Mayor Marion Barry referred to the war on drugs as the city's number one priority. And this was not just a verbal commitment in that same hearing, Marion Barry explained that this prioritization meant that the city had funneled more money towards law enforcement and corrections. The city redirected nearly $80 million away from the Department of Public Works, the Department of Houston Housing and Community Development, the Department of Recreation, the Department of Employment Services, and the University of the Direct District of Columbia and towards law enforcement and corrections. The city's $3 billion budget for 1990 included just $20 million for drug treatment 
as compared to $227 million for correction. So the city's overwhelming response to problems associated with the drug trade, and there were many, many problems, but the primary response was to strengthen the coercive arm of the state. Instead of paying for parks and libraries and better schools, the city took the path of carceral investment Instead of addressing these root problems and widespread economic precarity, the city focused on the symptom, which was the spread of crack and its attendant violence. By 1997, half of young black men in DC were under the control of the criminal legal system. Black men in DC had an incarceration rate that was 36 times that of, black, of white men. So again, the, the racial disparities were off the charts. Um, and this, the incarceration went, rate went from about 400 persons for 100,000 residents in 1978 to 1,712 in 1994. This was 4.4 times the national rate and it was the highest incarceration rate in the world. So by the 1990s, 4,000 black men had been murdered, public schools were failing and the black middle class was leaving the city. So disinvestment followed by carceral investment gutted black neighborhoods and set the stage for gentrification. So let's just explore briefly how disinvestment, heavy policing, mass incarceration, and stagnant home values created the conditions for gentrification and the displacement of the black population from DC. So in 1970, Petworth was a majority black community with half of black families living in homes they owned. And today the neighborhood is only about 50% black and there are only 3000 black homeowners as compared to 5,000 in 1980. So black people who purchased homes in Petworth in 1950, 1960, 1970, 1980, would not see an increase in their home value for decades, right? So this is um, the average value of housing in Petworth uh, between 1940 and today, or really 2019, um, and it's adjusted for inflation. So, um, so as you can see, the homes were only increasing really at the rate of inflation. The data before 1980 was calculated a little different, a little sketchy, but what's really notable is just that period from 1980 to 2000, the data is all calculated in the same way. And this was a period of massive increase in wealth through home ownership in the United States among white people, but no, almost no increase um, for the black, for almost all black residents of Petworth. So the rise in home value in Petworth began in the 2000s, which corresponded with the arrival of non-black residents into the neighborhood and the decline in the number of black homeowners. So in Petworth, the two-story brick homes built for white people in the early 20th century have become attractive to white buyers once again. The twin forces of gun violence in the prison system took young black men out of the neighborhood. The mass exodus of white residents in the mid 20th century and then of the black middle-class residents in the late 20th century created the conditions for gentrification in the early 21st century. It became profitable for investors to purchase devalued homes, abandoned properties, and foreclosed homes to build new homes for new people. So in 2016, the real estate company Redfin produced a report showing the top 10 neighborhoods where you can make a profit from selling a home. Pebworth was number one in the country with an average profit of $337,000 per home. This list includes 10 neighborhoods. Um, a couple of them are right around here, but notably three of them are in DC, Petworth, Brookland, and Brightwood. And Brookland and Brightwood adjoin Petworth. They're just, they're right there. So th these three neighborhoods are a top 10 sites in the country for profit. Um, so let's go back to the Hintons. So the Hintons, they purchased their home in 1953 for about $20,000. They lived in the neighborhood for 45 years before selling their home in 1998 for $230,000. That is a very small profit on a 45 year investment. The people who bought the home from them sold it in 2019 for $700,000. That's a fair profit for a 20 year investment. But five months later, the home sold for $1.3 million which is a considerable profit for these investors. So these investors who made the home look from this to this extracted more value from this home in five months than the Hintons did in 45 years. So when Petworth was primarily black, it experienced disinvestment. This disinvestment works in various ways to depopulate the neighborhood, making it an optimal site of reinvestment. Today, Petworth has become profitable once again, 
but it's also become unaffordable for long-term residents. So decades of disinvestment in black communities in Washington, D.C. meant that home values remained stagnant, preventing black homeowners from accumulating wealth through homeownership. Schools in black homeowning communities had high dropout and low college enrollment rates in the 1980s and 1990s. When we add to this equation the carceral investment these neighbors experienced during the war on drugs, it becomes clear how and why black families in Washington, D.C. have had difficulty maintaining homeownership and building wealth across generations. Thank you. So. Thank you very much, Dr. Galashposo. That was a great seminar. Uh, at this time, we will now move on to our Q&A session with our audience members. If anyone in the audience has any questions, please raise your hand and I'll bring your mic to you. Hello, thank you for a very informative talk. I'm Pete, a PhD candidate in economics at UCR. And I have a question regarding the disinvestment in especially the public school system when more blacks move in the neighborhood. How much do you think that is due to statistical discrimination or how much is due to the negative social stigma of the inhabitants? Thank you. Um, I think if you think about it in practical terms, it's, it's basically... Uh, so we think about the period, you know, before home rule, um, the black residents were organizing in their neighborhoods. They're, they're going down to Congress and they're saying, hey, you know, we have this school here. It's not funded. We have this library. There's no books in it. We don't have a road. We don't have a bus stop. So they're going down to Congress and making these demands. Um, and these demands are falling on deaf ears because Congress basically doesn't have to listen to them. At that time, Congress, they're not actual constituents, so they don't really have any power. You know, they can't threatened to vote, to vote them out. Um, so that's in the kind of period before home rule. So after 1973, um, DC then um, gains home rule. And then now the city has control over its school board, control over its funding. Although decisions in DC continue to be subject, subject to congressional oversight. So um, the budget still has to be approved by Congress. So now we're operating in the context, um, you know, the post 1973 area, era, the schools are now almost all black, almost all students that go to school, that go to the schools are African-American um, and the schools are consistently underfunded. Um, and then this just has to do with um, the fiscal constraints, the constraints that the city is facing. But I think the more the question then becomes like, well, why, why are we letting this happen, right? And so we're, we as a country are letting this happen in our nation's capital um, because of the devaluing of black lives. So I think like, so on a practical, on a very practical sense, in order for this to change, someone with, someone with power would have to make a decision to change it, and, and the, the demands of black residents are just consistently ignored because they can ignore them. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's, 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 it's kind of, it's a structural challenge. Like the city doesn't have enough money. When the, when the, when Congress returns the city's power to itself in 1973, it does it in a, in a way where the city still doesn't have enough money to meet its basic needs, and that is kind of allowed to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is a really informative, really wonderful talk. Um, I have a kind of similar question about disinvestment, but I, I'm from the School of Poli Sci, so I guess I'm asking it from the other side. Um, uh, I'm really interested in the mechanisms by which disinvestment happen, um, because as I was talking, I'm, I'm most familiar with the case of public education in New Orleans, and disinvestment there kind of looks like the reworking of the public education system to be all about charter schools, right, and to take money out of neighborhoods. So I'm wondering, in, in D.C., is disinvestment usually through, like, direct channels of just, like, turning off funding or are they diverting to other projects in such a way to kind of do it uh more sneakily i guess to not be academic about it right and i think it's just, it, it, like it kind of happens at different in different ways at different stages so there's the pre-1973 era where there's just congress is just like yeah we don't care um and then there's the 1973 to 2000 era where the city is run by black people and black people are in the majority and the city's just structurally constrained, doesn't have the, doesn't have the funding that it needs to survive. And, and, and there's corruption and all kinds of things are going on. And, and then Congress is still making demands on the city during this time. Like um, 
1995, I think, Congress tells DC, you have to hire 1,500 more police officers or we're not going to fund you next year. So like, so there's structural constraints going on. And then in the more recent era, so um, from 2000 to the present, this is when we do see the rise of charter schools. So now DC public schools are, I think, about 50% charter. Um, and the DC public school system is interesting now um, because it's it was nine it was ninety three percent black I think in ni in nineteen seventy and then kind of in the nineties percent black up until two thousand. Today it's closer to um, eighty five percent black and Latino in both the charter and the um, traditional public school system, but it's it's it now is like extremely um, stratified. So there are many many schools that are. Uh, there, it's interesting. It, it's, it's different things are happening. Like there's now money, but somehow the money, somehow the students are still underserved. And I haven't really studied this most recent era to tell you exactly what's going on. But I think it's a, a super interesting area for someone else to take up. I'm um, kind of what's going on because the city has now invested tons of money into the schools themselves. Like many of the, those pictures of Coolidge, it doesn't look like that anymore. It's a beautiful building now. Uh, the, sc the school that um, Dr. Hinton's children attended, it was called West Elementary. Now it's called John R. Lewis Elementary. And it is a totally transformed, beautiful building, tons of investment into the school. Um, but what we see in D.C. pretty consistently is that the schools that have more white students have better academic outcomes. Very consistently. And the other thing that's super, I think people should study that's super interesting, is schools are now flipping both the charter and the public schools. Like they'll be 100% black or 100% black and Latino. And then there's a few of them that will flip. Like white parents will start sending their kids there. And the next thing you know, the school is now like 60% white and um, and everything's better. So like, I, don't, I don't know the mechanism. So you, it's just sort of what you can see. Um, and it might not even be better, it could just be perception. Um, where I live in Merced, California, people often say the schools are not good. And I think it's because the schools are majority Latino, but the schools are actually really good. So sometimes there's that just a racialized perception of the schools not being good. But it, yeah, so I think it's different stages. The mechanisms are different. But the fact of um, underserved black communities is kind of the constant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Tanya. Uh, this is really fascinating. Great. Um, I just sent you an email, by the way. Um, uh, as my sister-in-law is the senior social science librarian at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, and she began a project called Mapping Prejudice, yeah. which you may know. Of. Yeah. If you didn't, I included a link. Yeah. Um, but Universities are repositories of a lot of the uh, real estate and deed information yeah. along with the, the formal repositories. Uh, so they have access to all these restrictive covenants and they can actually map them out. Um, and then they went out to other universities to try to replicate this across the country. So um, if you haven't poured through their, their data, that might be of interest to you. Yeah. Um, and by the way, when we bought our house, we looked at, the chain of title and there at the very beginning is a restrictive covenant. Yep. Uh, very, very common. Um, but I had a, kind of two questions on either end of your, your historical arc. Uh, at the beginning, I was wondering what impact um, the Wilson administration had on the racial economics of DC and the real estate economics and law, since he imposed segregation on the city in a virulent way. Um, and on the more recent end of the arc, I'm wondering what was the impact of the Community Reinvestment Act and the tax system um, and the transformation of these neighborhoods? Because um, I could certainly imagine that the tax system, as the real estate values go up, effectively push out people that can no longer affect, afford the taxes. Yeah, what was, when did the Wilson administration end? Oh, 1920. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I, I by, the story for me mostly starts a little, a little bit after that. I do a little bit in the book, kind of the early 20th century, but what, what was going on in D.C. in the, um, in the, in the beginning of the 20th century is that um, you had, 
you had neighborhoods where black people, you had several neighborhoods where black people owned homes and owned land. Mm -hmm. And those were systematically um, appropriated by the state. I, I'm not quite sure. And, and, and I, what I know about Wilson is he did a lot of like, removing black people from positions in the government, right? And sort of, the, and as a, but there were other administrations and maybe his and, and other adjacent ones that were systematically stripping black people from land. So um, in Chevy Chase, which is on the uh, Western side of the city, there was a, there was a black community. And I think around probably, this is probably would have happened during the Wilson administration, but is maybe more related to the local government. Um, there was a black community of, um, formerly enslaved people that had purchased homes and they had a whole community and, school, and a school and the whole neighborhood was raised. They were all told to leave um, because the Chevy Chase land company wanted that neighborhood to be white um, in order because their perception was that that would increase um, land value. So they were kicked off of that land and that happened over and over again across the city. Um, and then a, a, there was another area called um, Berry Farms, which this is a little bit later. It was, Again, black people own home. They, the homes that have been given to them, or like not given to them, but sold to them at a very low price as part of reconstruction, mm -hmm. and then they were taken from them, and then public housing was built in this in its place. So, kind of consistently across different administrations of the early twentieth century, you just have systematic dis dispossession of black people. And then with the Community Reinvestment Act, um, so there's yeah, what you consistently see in Washington D.C. is that like when a neighborhood changes due to some big policy change, it could be hope six, it could be the community reinvestment act. So sort of like there's policies that create the possibility for change. Um, there's a neighborhood in DC called Capitol view, which is all the way at the um, Eastern end of the city. And you can see the Capitol from the end of it. It's, it's right at the, at the Maryland border. That neighborhood was um, actually interestingly, one of the few areas in the country where black people got FHA loans because um, the government was, the people in charge, literally, I mean, there's a book that says, you know, we got to give the colored some homes, otherwise they're going to come try and live over here. So they, in the 1930s, black people were able to get FHA loans over there to purchase homes. So you have this very nice um, black middle-class community with, you know, very nice home, wood, wood uh, brick homes with oak floors, very nice, um, built in the 1930s. And then that community, um, then in the 1940s or 50s, um, the, the federal government decides to put public housing there. A huge public housing complex of a thousand people right in this black middle class neighborhood and that creates all kinds of challenges in the neighborhood. Fast forward, the public housing gets destroyed through Hope 6 and then reinvested. But that neighborhood has new housing, new affordable housing. It has the, the older nice homes. So it has been like reinvestment through these different kinds of acts, but there's no... And, and it's still almost 100% black and there's no public amenity. There's no private amenities. There's, there's no um, grocery store. There's no coffee shops. Like there's, there's no public, private investment. There was, there was some negotiation. They were gonna put a Walmart there. They didn't even put, there was something happened. They didn't even put that. So, so that neighborhood is, so what you see in that neighborhood is that it has remained almost all black and there's very little to no pub private investment. And then there's an other neighborhood, similar thing happened, a kind of similar story, but at the end of the day, it becomes majority white and there's tons of investment. So there's a really racialized pattern of um, private investment. This, this I learned through like neighborhood, I just did a case study of five different neighborhoods. Um, I didn't systematically study it throughout the city, but you could kind of um, measure um, racial composition against um, private investment and see if, you, see if it would hold up in a larger analysis, but I didn't do that. <laughs> I think he had a question behind. Thanks. My question, can you, is, it, is this on? Okay. Uh, my question has to do with colorblind policy, public policy and colorblind jurisprudence perhaps, especially in the Supreme Court and federal courts, but it's informed by Gary Orfield's dismantling desegregation by Ira Katz Nelson, when affirmative action was white, mm -hmm. uh, a book by Cheryl Cashin, I forget the name, but about the DC area and the middle, the middle income black uh, uh, neighborhoods in, outside of DC, mm -hmm. and her 
her theory that they have absorbed uh, much of the of the, uh, much more of the black population, and so they are subsidizing what the state governments will not do in terms of social services. The black middle class, that is, in terms of lower income blacks moving into the outer ring of uh, the, the suburbs. And then finally, Christopher Bonastia wrote a book, I forget the, the title. Um, Christopher Bonastia wrote a book that said uh, Johnson was weak towards the end of his, his presidency, as we all know. But the Civil Rights Act of 64 was the beginning of desegregation because it was a an enforcement mechanism, mm -hmm. uh, and the federal courts enforced this, the desegregation orders, and that the Voting Rights Act of '65 had an enforcement mechanism with the preclearance. So, uh, by he said the, the Housing Act didn't have that same that same vigorous enforcement mechanism. So that's why we still have a lot of housing. Um, the, the, the discrepancies and inequalities. So my question has to do with uh, uh, colorblind public policy, colorblind uh, uh, judicial decisions up to the Supreme Court that as I think the, the, the Chief Justice would say, in order to get rid of racial uh, inequities, we have to not consider race. So what do you think about those? Yeah, <laughs> um, I mean, so it, it, yeah, the, the, the government can try and be colorblind if it wants to, but we're not, right? Like, people are not colorblind. People see race and they make decisions based on race and they, and people make, um, even, so it's interesting, like even just if you, if you, um, I don't know much about the Riverside area and the school system, but you probably can imagine a scenario where you're talking to um, your liberal white colleague about sending their kid to a school that's majority non-white and just the kinds of things that they will say, like, and, and the things I've heard are like, I, you know, I don't want to sacrifice my kids or like, for my value, you know, so it's very like people get very complicated when it comes to their children. And so, the, so, so even if we believe in equality, um, the United States is so unequal that we don't want our kids to be on the wrong side of that. And it's a real fear. I mean, because especially today, like, it is, it is a real fear that your children, um, well, if you're my age, <laughs> that your children might not attain the success that you've attained, right? Because it, it is because it, we are part of a very small percentage of people who have financial security in the United States. Um, and so in, and in my generation, it's maybe more common to have financial security, but our kids, you know, it's very unknown. So there's, so there's a lot of insecurity and that a lot of that is racialized and people are worried like about putting their kids in the right environments and, and those, uh, those, th those, visions are colored by race, right? Literally, like, so people imagine like, oh, if I put my kid in this majority non-white context, they might not be successful, right? And then that could have all sorts of serious. So I think that the bigger problem really is economic precarity um, for the next generation in particular, and then and kind of how people think through that. But I want to say a couple of things about DC and the suburbs. So, um, so what happened in DC is, um, so in 1954, when schools were desegregated, I mean, you literally have a block in Petworth where it is 100% white in 1950. So after the covenants have been, you know, the covenants have been, are not enforceable, but the block is still 100% white, 80% homeowners. By 1960, that same block is 80% black, 80% homeowners. So people are selling those homes very quickly. So the white people are selling those homes and going to the suburbs. And that is primarily motivated, I think, by school desegregation, because it's there are these real estate actors kind of um, encouraging people to purchase homes, but I don't think it's I don't think it makes a lot of sense to just blame the real estate agents. It's the people that want to don't want to send their kids to these racially integrated schools in nineteen in the nineteen fifties. Um, they really sit, like and the schools will change. Like you look at a school, it will be one hundred percent white in nineteen fifty three, and in nineteen fifty four it will be one hundred percent black. Like every single white per parent in that. East, particularly in the elementary schools. Roosevelt was a high school, so it, it, it took a little bit longer. It took about 10 years to flip. But the elementary schools literally, like, because there's, like, there's um, people, a lot of people have done studies on that time, and it's just, like, 100% white, 100% black, one year to the next. Um, so that, so there's, so people's individual prejudices and ideas are at play in 1954, and they're still at play today, right? That, that hasn't changed. I mean, things have changed, but the underlying discrimination hasn't changed. Um, and then, so, 
so white people were moving to the suburbs in the 1950s, but black people couldn't. Like they, it was, it was closed. So Bowie, Maryland, those neighborhoods in Prince George's County that today are almost all black. In 1955, they were almost all white, and um, and black people could not move there because this because this Fair Housing Act hadn't passed. So now by 19, 19, late 1960s, the Fair Housing Act had passed, and now black people can purchase homes in those neighborhoods, and they do. And what do you think the white people do? They leave. They go to Montgomery County, right? Where now black people technically can purchase homes, but it's unfavorable climate. So black people, so black middle class people tend to move over to um, Prince George's County. But if you're a black middle class person in DC in 1970, and you can afford, you could either afford, you could stay in Petworth, which the houses, the housing is relatively affordable. The schools are really not good. Um, you could move up to Shepherd Park where housing is more expensive, the schools are still not, you, you have access to a slightly better school if you move over here, but really not that great of a school. Um, or you can move out to the suburbs where you can get a bigger house and cheaper and the schools are still not good. So like you're, so there's a significant tax on the black middle class of either sending your kids to a school that's not great or paying for private school. And today in Prince George's County, it, it's remarkable how many kids are going to private school. Right. So African-American middle class families not only are buying these large homes in Prince George's County that are expensive, they're also paying for private schools, um, especially when it gets to. So so white middle class families have have more opportunities to purchase a home in a neighborhood where they feel comfortable and they're welcomed and send their kids to the local public school for free. So you pay homes in Montgomery County. Yes, are a million dollars, one point five million dollars. But at least you don't also have to pay for uh, you know fifty thousand dollars a year for private school, which is what um, a lot of the black parents are doing. So, so you can tr you can pass, you can try and be colorblind, but the both the individual pre prejudice and the structural inequalities persist. Any other questions? We have plenty of time, so ask away. So you talked a little bit about uh, carceral, carceral investment in D.C., and I was wondering if with more knowledge and more awareness about um, the root causes of crime, if there's been less investment or divestment in, um, in law enforcement in the D.C. area and how that has potentially affected students in those areas. Yeah, it's a great question. So now we know, looking back, um, the war on drugs was a disaster. We spent way too much money locking way too many people up across the country, and we have devast we devastated a whole generation um, of African Americans. Um, but somehow, people in the United States, in particular, are fundamentally attached to the idea that punishment is the best solution. So it, it, it that like so yes, there's all kinds of research that says that we should do other things. Um, it's really hard to change policy around this. There's a couple of reasons for it. Um, there's a great book by Jonathan Simon that came out of uh, maybe over a decade, a couple of decades ago. But he argues that basically um, criminals are just not a constituency, but victims are <laughs> a constituency, like the rise of victims as a constituency. So people don't kind of imagine people who might c commit crimes or have committed crimes as sort of part of their constituency. And it's also very dangerous for a politician to be lax on crime because all it takes is one murder in your district. And then now you're, uh, you know, so, and, and you see this in particular with like, um, like even in San Francisco, like one undocumented man committed a murder, right? Out of the hundreds of thousands of undocumented people in the Bay area, there's one guy, he murders someone. And now, Oh, the, the, the city's too lax on, on undocumented people, too lax on crime. And, you know, and, and there, there's really like, so it's really not in politicians' interest to be lax on crime, you know, as, if they're thinking about getting reelected because of the unfortunate situation that like one person can commit a crime and then like it makes national news and people are not logical about the fact that like, yes, one undocumented person killed someone, that's terrible. And five citizens killed someone. <laughs> and we're not, but you know, like also that same day and there's nothing we can, you know, so that is, so that's one part of it. Um, there is there, you know, there is some movement. I mean, DC, DC is a very interesting city politically to, right now. 
you got this combination of um, the long-standing black political power, and then you now have um, liberal whites, because DC is a very democratic city. I mean, ninety-five percent probably Democrat. Like, it's very, not, very few conservatives live in the city. Um, so, uh, but at the same, but even, but, but at the same time, people, both parties. I mean, both um, the long-standing black population and the Democratic or liberal whites have a hard time really, really believing that um, policing is not the solution. And policing makes white people feel safe. So I went to a, a city, uh, like a community hearing on, on gun violence. And, um, and people were just saying like, you know, like some of the white residents of Petworth today were saying, you know, like I, um, I want to see police officers outside because it makes me feel safe. Now, that's, that's not exactly what they said, but that's what they were saying. Right, like it makes me so it, the the visible presence of police does not reduce crime very much, but it makes voters, constituents, like feel safer. Makes some people feel safer, um, and that's kind of where we are. So that that's pretty intractable problem, but um, you know, I'm still hopeful that one day we can have evidence based um, <laughs> solutions because we do. There, there's a general shared goal in the city that we want to reduce gun violence. We want to increase um, school enrollment, we want to increase graduation rates and there's kind of, so there's hope still, hope springs eternal that we can, that we can get more, but it is, it is a, it is a challenging policy area for those reasons. Any other questions? So, uh, a comment, <clears throat> a comment and a question. Um, the comment is the, kind of punitive approach um, to social policy uh, actually has its manifestations in housing policy as well, where in the, in the 40s and 50s into the 1960s, uh, rather than focus on lending to would-be homeowners, there's the construction of these massive public housing projects, which by design, were less desirable because it is a semi-punitive approach to housing. You shouldn't be getting the same quality housing as everybody else, which has the effect of concentrating, um, <clears throat> but also creating less desirable um, housing um, with all sorts of spillover effects. So you have the you know, infamous cases like Cabrini Green, and I'm sure, sure there are equivalents in, mm -hmm. in DC as well. Um, the question I had is, um, how representative is the D.C. case with respect to other major urban areas in the country um, with respect to the great migration out of the South into industrial jobs and then the consequences of deindustrialization, which hits the black community especially hard? Yeah, so DC is different from other cities. I think there are some parallels. So I think I think you could find a similar pattern of disinvestment, carceral investment, and gentrification in other cities that also experience a great migration, and then de but then they experience deindustrialization. But DC didn't experience deindustrialization. Um, it doesn't didn't has never really had a strong industrial sector um, at all. So and so the DC has had like some ups and downs in terms of unemployment in particular, and, and, and like many other cities, it did have very high levels of um, black youth unemployment in the 1980s, e even without the loss of factory jobs. It just, it was, there's still, <laughs> there still weren't any jobs for young black men. So I think that, I think what makes, I think any city that has um, a significant black, a significant mi black migration would find, you would find similar patterns I mean, one of the other big differences about D.C. in terms of gentrification in particular is um, in in the year 2000 in D.C., there were no poor white neighborhoods. So in, in many cities, gentrification starts in poor white neighborhoods because of, because people have because gentrification.
I'm going to start by saying that um, I, don't, I don't think we're headed towards mass deportation. Um, Trump's immigration policies, his, his primary strategy is to create fear, right? Because um, during the high, so the, uh, Obama was the most effective deportation in, in the most effective president at interior deportations, which is what we're mostly concerned about. He, those of us who live in the United States, I mean, the, the return to Mexico policies, those are all terrible for human rights, um, terrible for people coming into the border, but they don't affect like the local population in the same way. So um, at the height of the Obama administration, he might have achieved 188,000 people per year. Um, but that required significant buildup, right? So, so it is, and we're not there anymore. We're not at 188,000 interior deportations presently. I'm not quite sure where we are. It's actually very hard to get data specifically on interior removals. Um, but I did look yesterday, I think, at the detention numbers. There are 38,000 people in detention but 20, 25,000 of them are recent arrivals, like people detained at the border. The other um, 13,000 are people who are presently in detention, who will probably will be deported, who are who were living in the United States and convicted of a criminal offense. Um, so anyway, all that, so, so the numbers are terrible, like 188,000 people is a lot of people, um, but it's, it's, it's a small percentage of the overall population, right? So the likelihood that any individual undocumented person would be deported. It continues to be low. So I think kind of the question becomes more, I think in this particular policy context, any like people either are kind of on one side or the other. Either they understand that like mass deportation is um, a terrible policy project and will not bring any good to this country or they just are like anti-immigrant and nativist and they're probably not to be swayed. So I, I think trying to speak to the nativists is, is kind of not our best strategy right now, but um, for me, the the strategy that we need at this point is um, is to figure out how to empower communities and make people feel safe and kind of what we were doing in the before, like when there was like apps where you could find out where the checkpoints are and you know where the police are and kind of like those kinds of things are actually keeping people safe and also because people. So the point of the Trump's policy is fear. The point is not to remove every, all the undocumented immigrants. It definitely does not. He definitely does not plan to. Has no plans to do that. Or he, he would not be able to affect that. Um, as, as I said, one hundred eighty-eight thousand times four is seven hundred thousand people. Less than ten percent of the population. That's the max he could possibly do within his administration, in my opinion. But he. But what he can do is create a lot of fear. What he will do is do a massive thing at the border, because then he'll be able to say. We had this big event yesterday. We got 20,000 people and it'll be like some spectacle, right? And then there might be some worksite raids, which are terrible. But, you know, the biggest worksite raid we've ever had, I think, removed 300 people. And that took six months to plan, 600 police officers, 600 federal agents to carry it out. So it's a, it's a spectacle of fear. So I think that's so when the, when the point is fear, when the policy, the point of the policy is to create fear then the response is to organize in the community. How about the data of success, right? Those doctor recipients and what they've done with work authorization and temporary conditions. Right, so I think the, the larger question is, um, it, okay, so it's the kind of the broad, step back and think about the overall structure of the labor market, right? So right now, um, unemployment is relatively low, right? Among people that are actively seeking unemployment, but we have a lot of people out of the labor force, right? A lot of people that are kind of struggling out of the labor force. So it is, it is certainly, like you could mix things up. You could get more DACA recipients into better positions. You could get more people of color into better positions. But the, the broader economic picture is that we're, it's difficult and it's only gonna get worse. John and I were just, John can probably talk about this better than I can. But basically, like, you can, you're, you could make, so yes, you can, you can make the case. You can convince people who are already friendly to your perspective, like, hey, wait a second. If we just, you know, if we give people the opportunity to go to college, 
um, we give them a work permit, you know, they're, they're more li likely to do better. That's true, but you're just mixing up an already like difficult situation. So you're, you're maybe letting in a few more um, undocumented people into this, but the problem is the overall. So for me, the, the uh, my strategy is more like, let's look at the overall structure of the labor market and let's see, like people can't afford housing, right? So the, the young folks in the room, you're not planning on building any home equity through any wealth through home equity, probably, because the chances of you doing that are very low unless your parents are going to give you a home. Right. But but your chances of buying a home here with like just a regular job and building wealth, very low. Right. So you <laughs> so like this, this is there's structural problems like the future of the next generation is in peril and whether or not we get a few more different kinds of people into there through like diversity initiatives. Great. But the problem is the structures. So I think we need to think more about more comprehensive solutions. That's what I think. So like, um, you know, universal basic income, um, decommodified housing, right. We need to kind of, we need to make sure that everybody has the opportunities to succeed because otherwise you're making the case. Yeah. Okay. These people are succeeding against all odds. But for me, the problem are the odds, right? Like, and, and the odds are not good. For um for the young folks today. <laughs> Any other questions? We had a great questions today, by the way. We're good on time. So if anyone would like to, like to ask, I'd encourage them. Is Washington D.C. unique in its jurisdiction over the District of Columbia and those neighborhoods around Washington? I know that there's been a lot of disinvestment in other neighborhoods, but is D.C. unique in its ability to control and pass acts and and control the disinvestment in the way that it has historically over the decades that you've covered? So D.C. is unique in that when D.C. passes a law, it has congressional oversight. So. Um, so, most, so, for example, right now, a, a few years ago, um, the residents of District of Columbia voted that marijuana should be legalized. And Congress was like, I don't think so. So, yeah. But what D.C. did was um, they just decriminalized it themselves. They just don't enforce the laws. So they, and they created their own kind of workaround. So you, can, um, you, you can't purchase marijuana in D.C., but you can go to a store and buy a t-shirt and they'll give you marijuana. <laughs> so, so anyway, but all that to say like DC has, yeah, we're still constrained by the federal government, but they still have congressional, there's still congressional oversight over our budget and over um, our laws. And, the, and the, the anti-democratic thing about that is, like I said, DC is today probably 50% um, black and Congress is not 50% black. And, um, and DC is also, like I said, at least 90% Democrat and Congress is usually 50% Democrat, 50% Republican. So we have congressional oversight that in a pretty undemocratic, non-representative way. Awesome, solid. Any other questions we might have in the room? Hi. Hi. Um, I'm interested in the car sale investment going into gentrification. You talked about Troy um, being incarcerated. And I'm wondering what re-entry like for Troy would look like now that you're, you know, that now gentrification is happening. Because um, here in Riverside, we have like the crime-free housing program where background checks are happening and you can't live in certain like apartments or, you know, just or even buy a home. So I'm wondering in D.C. if something similar. Yeah. And it's super interesting because um, it, it, it goes back to my earlier point about the structure, right? DC has some of the most favorable re-entry policies in the country. So um, we have the ban the box. Um, we, um, they have tons of re-entry programs. Like actually I was, I did some work with formerly incarcerated people here in California. And I was surprised that there was almost in Merced, like there was almost no support. In DC, there's a ton of support. So people return home from prison, even after 30, 40 years behind bars and they do secure housing and they secure work, but the work is, low paid so they can't afford it like so the problem is like yeah you can get a job and dc has a pretty high high minimum wage 17 15 an hour but it's not enough 17 15 an hour even if you got 40 hours a week is not enough to afford housing in dc so um formerly incarcerated people are able to find work um very difficult for them to find work above minimum wage 
and they are able to find housing, but then they, they can't afford it. So then they end up often, a lot of the people we spoke to and lived with relatives, like they live in their sister's house or their, you know, their grandparents' house or something like that. So the, so the, again, the, it's, there's a structural problem where affordable housing is a huge problem. And so the city has all kinds of affordable housing policies, but there's not enough, right? So the apartment building will have 10% affordable housing, but so 10% of people get affordable housing, but other people can't afford it. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, good to see you, Kathy Eiler. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is fascinating to me because um, actually today I'm going to be speaking with our science to policy students about the impact of the Trump administration on higher education, right? Um, but specifically with, with this issue in our nation, what is there something that we can do to create awareness, to decrease the unconscious bias around these policies that have taken place over the years? And, you know, where do we, where do we start? Do we start locally? Do we start global? I mean, where, where do we start? So I think for a lot, I talk about lots of different policies, but I think um, for me, the housing, the unaffordability of housing. Okay. So we have a racial wealth gap in the United States, which is fueled by inequality in housing. And it's a huge problem and it's intractable, I think. So the best way out of it is to decommodify housing. And universities are in a very unique position to be able to do that. Because guess what? Dorms are decommodified housing. Faculty housing, decommodified housing. Staff housing, decommodified housing. So, and I actually, I actually think that California could do this, like that is politically feasible because this is the, it's on the region's agenda. How, housing is a problem at Santa Barbara, <laughs> at LA, at UCLA, at UC Berkeley, at UC Santa Cruz, like a huge problem, right? And it's a problem everywhere, but it's like really a problem at those campuses. And there's just no, the only solution out of the housing crisis for staff in particular at UC Santa Barbara is for the university to build housing. And we can, the University of California could build housing. Um, so I think that's like, if we're thinking about like, what's a practical thing that we can do. And like I said, the young folks in here, they're, they already understand that they're not gonna build wealth through home equity, unless they are gonna inherit a bunch of money from their parents and buy and, and get a home in LA. And then maybe they will, maybe they won't, who knows what's gonna happen with the housing market. But they're, they're amenable. A lot of people are going to be very amenable to university provided decommodified housing. So decommodified housing means like the university owns it. So then they can increase the price according to you know, inflation and, and take care of it. So you don't, you don't get rich off of it, but you also don't um, lose a ton of money. Your, your, your rent doesn't, in, doesn't double from one month to the next. So, so I think that's the, like out of all the, any policy recommendation I could make for at a university would be, start working now to create university housing. That's an amazing idea. And, and UCR has done something to help with that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So we're actually building housing for um, our community college students to house with our undergraduate mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. And that building is being built right now. And we're the only one, I think, in California, maybe in the nation, that is doing that in collaboration with community colleges. So we're trying to uh, bring other communities together to do that, but great idea. And it's similar, uh, Riverside is a little bit similar to Merced. Um, but one thing that's happening in Merced is housing is becoming unaffordable. And I'm like, guys, we're the end of the line. Like, like, yeah. like, 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 like literally. So people move from San Francisco to Tracy, from Tracy to Stockton, and from Stockton to Merced. And from Merced, like, there's no cheaper housing to go to. So, like, if you can't, if you work at Target and can't afford to live in Merced, like that's it, right? So, so Riverside is probably you know similarly like at, at the lower end of the area, right? And then the, and so you, it's a it's a place where we really need to figure out affordable housing for students, staff, and faculty. You know, have any questions? We have time for approximately one more question. <clears throat> Um, thank you for your patience with this next question. <laughs> um, yes, uh, we're provost or vice provost? Uh, mm, just department chair. Oh, okay. Uh, well, in your UC, mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you think about what uh, Governor DeSantis 
circumstances has been in Florida and Governor Abbott in, in Texas vis a vis, you know, a profound impact on, on higher public higher education, uh, which I think is not good in those two cases. Yeah. I think that California won't do that. I also think, you know, what it was interesting. Um, so President Michael Drake came to D.C. a few months ago in the aftermath of like this anti-DEI decision or the Supreme Court decision that we can't take race into account. And he was like, and he came because we've been doing this in California since Prop 209. So what I think California teaches us is that if you want to diversify your student body, you don't need affirmative action to do it. Right. If you want to diversify your faculty, you don't need affirmative action to do it. Right. And you also can do it in the context of these anti of these of these bans. So here, give me a, another example. Um, when, pre when Trump was president last time, he issued some executive order banning DEI, something like that. You know, I ban DEI. It, it, the statement was ridiculous. It said something like no anti-white policies. So Stanford looked at the policy and was like, oh, shoot, we're closing down our DEI office. Jen Napolitano was president, and we got challenges with her, but she was president of UC at the time, <laughs> like those of us who study immigration, but she looked at her and her lawyers looked at the policy and were just like, yeah, um, we don't do any of that. Like we're fine. And they were ready with their lawyers to stand up. So all that to say, I really think like when it comes to diversity in undergraduate admissions, diversity in hiring, and that is, this is an area I've worked in a lot, the, the the legal framework puts some constraints on you, but if you if you want to diversify your faculty, you can. You, okay, so that uh, the curricular the curricular piece again. I mean, I think if you if, it it depends on what it is. I haven't read the Florida like actuals what they say, but a lot of times what they say is pretty ridiculous. Like, well, the last it says like you can't teach anti-white bias and i'm like okay good i don't i don't do that or but um I, I suppose if it got to the point where it's like you can't teach about slavery you know then but i don't know i mean california is not going to get to that point so and i haven't read the florida stuff specifically right because i think i think what we saw in the last trump administration was university of california standing up and being like yeah we're we're protecting our daca students we're we're not gonna go with your anti-diversity stuff yeah so I have faith in California, so, <laughs> um, but and I haven't followed the debates very closely in Florida and Texas because, you know, I'm trying to leave some space for joy in my life. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's California and D.C., two places that are, you know, have, have, have some reasonable policies that we can hold on to. Unfortunately, that is all the time for questions we have. And I'd like to thank Dr. Galash Boza for being here and giving such an informative seminar. Um, I'll just give a little more info. But I would just like to say that while you're, um, I'd just like to thank you, everyone in the audience, for coming down to see this and for being with us today. Uh, we'd hope to see you all at any upcoming UCR School Public Policy events. And you can keep up by just checking us out at ucr.spp.edu. And while you're there, you can also learn about our Master's of Public Policy program and the BA MPP program. Additionally, you can learn about our official podcast series, Policy Chats. Um, and we'd like to once again thank you all for joining us. And please help yourselves to refreshments, water, pizza, and feel free to talk to our wonderful guest speaker. With that being said, we'd like you all to have an amazing day and an amazing Thanksgiving holiday. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thanks, Raphael. Thank you.